So they can take questions from the audience here, as they will in a moment, and from the viewers at home, and there's still a chance uh, to get involved. Uh, you can vote on the debate as it happens using our real-time Sky Pulse. Uh, you can do that via the Sky News website. And uh, you can also decide which of the questions that you've already submitted on social media the candidates should be asked next. Just follow Sky News on social media using the hashtag Labour Debate. But we're going to start with a question from our audience here in Gateshead and from uh, Councillor Anne Wheeler. What would you do about the refugee crisis? Succinct, what would you do about the refugee crisis? Uh, I should tell you the government uh, in the last half hour has said that it's going to take 4,000 extra uh, refugees, but from the camps established on the borders uh, of the zone rather than from uh, the boat people. Jeremy Corbyn. 4,000 doesn't sound like enough, but I think we have to look at the crisis in the widest possible context. These are desperate people fleeing from the war in Syria and many other wars and human rights abuse is all across the region. They're dying in the Mediterranean. Some are getting across to Europe. So we have to hold out the hand of humanity and support and friendship to give succour and comfort to people who are utterly desperate at the present time. Do you have any but idea we all, on numbers? Also, could you say also we need a UN response worldwide because there are more displaced people on this world than has ever been in recorded history. There has to be a real movement to do something about the inequalities across the world but also the people that are victims of war and environmental disasters. But given that, do you have any idea on, on numbers? Numbers... Uh, Numbers to be taken immediately should be done fairly and every European country should do its best. Germany has shown the way by its recognition of the desperate need and taken the largest number. I think they've taken 80,000 or so in the past year. Um, I don't know what number we need to take and I couldn't put a figure on it, but I think we have to look at this as a human and humanitarian crisis and not use abusive language against people who are in an utterly desperate situation as none of us would want to be in ourselves. Exactly. Okay. Well, it's welcome if the government have changed their position. I think that is a response to the huge public pressure, because I think people across Britain are deeply troubled by the images that we have seen of desperate families, desperate refugees, the really heartbreaking uh, images and pictures that we have seen. But I think they're going to need to do more than this, because it's a, it's a good thing to take 4,000 people from the camps and from those closest to Syria, because that is where uh, you know, the real problems have been arisen from and where you've got millions of people have left their homes. But I think they also need to do something to help those who are now uh, spread across Europe, where you've seen in Greece 50,000 refugees arriving in the space of a month. And other countries are doing their bit. We have got to do more as well. I've called for you know, people in uh, cities like this across the country to come forward and say, look, how many people can we help? If every city, if every county, if every community across the country came forward and said, we can help 10 refugee families, we could help 10,000 people very, very quickly. I think we should do that. I think we should ask across the country. I think British people have made clear they want to be able to do their bit to help refugees. It is a moral obligation on us. We absolutely cannot turn our backs on this crisis. So, to answer Anne's question, I would do two things, show compassion and show leadership. And I'm afraid the government has been found wanting here, hasn't it? Over the course of the summer, this tragedy has been unfolding on our television screens. So it's got to the point today where we've seen an image that would make anybody... Uh, well, it wouldn't have left anybody unmoved in the country, but any parent of a child that age would just feel sick to the pit of their stomach. So, you know, things have got to change, and the government has got to act now. What I would be doing, because you asked that question, I would be getting on a plane to Brussels tomorrow, I would be sitting down with other heads of state from across Europe, I would be agreeing a plan to deal with this situation across Europe. I would be putting the British plan to Parliament on Monday. I would be taking control if I was David Cameron. I'm afraid he has shown a complete absence of leadership on this issue all across the summer, and it is simply not good enough. Yes, Kevin. <laughs> What the government has proposed is nowhere near enough. And my gut instinct is, in the face of this appalling humanitarian crisis, 
and with Germany taking 800,000 refugees this year, that we should be taking something in the tens of thousands. And over the past few days, I've been ashamed of the British government. I think that David Cameron has appeared both heartless and powerless on the refugee crisis. And my message to David Cameron is this. You now have an opportunity to do the right thing. If you're worried about the political space, don't. We will back you if we take the right decisions. Let's face up to the problems. Andy is right. There should be an immediate meeting of EU leaders, not waiting until mid-September for a meeting of interior ministers. And we should be calling together the leaders of councils right across this country. Already, the leader of Newcastle City Council, I spoke to you today, is prepared to do more, as is the leader of Camden Council. There is a willingness out there, and I think David Cameron is behind public opinion. Do the right thing, take the opportunity, take action now. But, but, but in the end... <laughs> you're standing for positions of leadership. You can criticise the government position, but in the end, are any of you prepared to say that we should take refugees, including those people who are coming out illegally and crossing borders illegally on a scale with Germany, because that probably points in terms of population to half a million people. I mean, can we uh, absorb half a million people? Well, I think we should be careful about using the word crossing borders illegally. When people are They're fleeing refugees. from wars and oppression and human rights abuses, it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And the 1951 Geneva Convention recognises that. So I think we should say desperate people seeking safety yeah. rather than dress it up in some quasi-legal way. Well, argument. I would, yes, the we point should I was making no, is that no, the government... Point. The government is clearly drawing a distinction between those people who go to the sanctioned refugee camps and those people who are crossing the Mediterranean by other means. We need to put far more resources into the refugee camps, not just in Lebanon, but also in Libya. We need to give far more support in those situations. Uh, we also need to take a reasonable, fair, fair share across Europe. The British government refused to take part in a European programme. There hasn't been a proper UN programme on this. There has to be a unified decision yeah. all across Europe and through the UN. Uh, and we should I mean, take a to considerable number. Adam, to pick up, number. Here, you Adam, pick up your point, because it is a reasonable point. Uh, you do have to be sure that people are genuine refugees. I believe the government should be working with the UN to take people who are in camps on the Syrian border, so in Turkey, be, uh, in Turkey. Because that means you don't then give people an incentive to risk everything and cross the Mediterranean with their children. If the word goes out that people will be taken from camps overseen by the UN, genuine refugees, then I think you would not uh, send out the message to people that it is still worth crossing the Mediterranean. That is the plan that we need to be developed with all European countries so that, that message can go out to people. And that, of course, uh, means that the, the gangs and the traffickers who are, who are benefiting from this awful situation uh, would see that their, their, their lines of supply were cut off. I think we can... Okay. I think we can go much further. What we've done this week together, what people have done across the country by showing their strong support for helping the refugees is change the government's policy in mm. just a few mm. days. Yeah. We can do much more than this. So yes, there are things that should be happening across Europe. There are things that need to be taking place in terms of cracking down on the vile criminal gangs who are trading in humanity. I mean, who are you know, making profit from what is effectively modern day slavery with what they are doing. There's all sorts of those things that need to happen. The making sure that we take people directly from the camps in Syria is something that the Labour Party has called for for 18 months. So there's all those things we should do. But I think here in Britain, this opportunity for us to do our bit, for every city and town to do our bit. The reason I think is the more you have cities and towns themselves coming forward and saying, this is what we want to do. We want to be cities of sanctuary. We want to help. We want to okay. say we're proud of our tradition, just going back to the but, kinder transport okay, I'm, I'm and all of that. But this moment, is important. But I uh, want to remind Adam, our viewers uh, that uh, they can give a verdict on what they're hearing tonight's debate as it's happening using our digital Sky Pulse tool. Just go to skynews.com to have your say. Uh, and on social media, you've been voting for the question you want to put to the candidates next. And these were uh, the options of questions you suggested uh, on the subject of immigration. Uh, here are the questions that you've been voting on. And as you can see, the most popular choice is question two from uh, Samantha uh, on Twitter, who asked, will you continue the policies that are leaving people to die in the Mediterranean, with 32% uh, 
of the vote uh, calling for that question. And, and but that Adam, really... you interrupted me. Can I just finish the point? The reason I say this is because we have called on councils across the country this week to come forward with the number they're doing. So I just say to yeah. people who are watching and people who are in this room, contact your local council and urge them to do more okay. because they are doing so. We're already doing this. And I think people across the country have the power in our hands at the moment to force the government to do more. We must not stop. We have yeah. done so now. But... This is about our humanitarian crisis okay. that we have to but... respond to. But... Liz Kevin, a specific question mm -hmm. uh, there asked by Samantha is what we do from here mm -hmm. to stop the horrific traffic of people and the horrific casualty rate amongst people, including that young child on the Turkish beach yesterday? Absolutely. And uh, let me just say on the last point that Yvette made, yes, it's right that councils come forward with a plan, but we need a prime minister who shows leadership on this issue and mm -hmm. doesn't just wait mm -hmm. for others to come forward. Um, on the crisis in the Mediterranean, um, it was appalling that at one point we stopped support for the search and rescue mm -hmm. across the Mediterranean. That was a shaming moment for us. I am glad that that has been put back in place, but we need to urgently review whether enough support is happening for that programme as a first step. And secondly, we need to look at the root causes of the problem and why people are fleeing. There was a report on the BBC actually last night about the problems within Libya. The journalist had spoken to some of these vile traffickers oh. who suggested that they were actually being supported or helped by some of the authorities there. We have to get a proper settlement and build the capacity of the new Libyan government there. That is one of the root causes of the problem. <laughs> Similarly too, we have not yet seen a proper political strategy for dealing with the problems in Syria. You know, the Prime Minister has been correct that we face a generational yeah. struggle against ISIL, but we haven't seen anywhere near enough action sure. working with countries in the region to try and bring more uh, stability to that part of the world. But you all hope to lead the Labour Party back into government. I assume you do. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. And, 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 and you, for example, Andy yeah. Burnham, you... Yeah. you we were talking earlier on this year about your concern <coughs> about uh, traditional Labour voters yep. being attracted by UKIP. Yes. Now, standing here and saying, well, maybe we have to take hundreds of thousands of the people involved uh, in this crisis, is that going to bring back uh, those uh, UKIP-inclined Labour voters? Well, I hadn't used that figure, but, but yeah, we should always do our part, so play our part to, to give people refuge, but it's a different, different issue, isn't it, uh, Adam, to offer people asylum as opposed to free movement of Labour. But here's my point, because actually, in the end, I believe these two things are linked. If David Cameron did show leadership, as Liz rightly says, then if he brought some goodwill from people around Europe, he would then be in a better position to go to the rest of Europe and say, do you know what, we want to see changes as part of free movement of labour across Europe coming with the referendum we're holding in this country. We want to see wages protected and not undercut. We want to see more support for communities most affected by EU migration. This is the point, isn't it? If he did the right thing now, he would be in a better place to get yeah. support from other countries okay. to get changes that we want to see to the yeah, rules I mean, around Chancellor free Merkel movement. Chancellor has put a figure on the sort of scale of... Uh, people that she feels her country needs to absorb. Can any of you do that? Well, I've already said I think we should start well, tens with the, of thousands the ten. You've well, said. I think that's a start because you start with what people and councils will come forward and offer. So I do think you should be able to talk about numbers. I think we can't just you know hide away from the numbers discussion. I mean, the European but you model made, points to more than a hundred thousand. Well, it, it, the... that's shared between countries. But you made an important yeah. point about concern about immigration. We have got to start treating immigration and asylum as different. They are completely different when you're talking about people right. who are travelling to work, who've got safe homes okay. to go to, and people who have no home to go to. To. The government treats them as the same. It's wrong. Right. I don't know if anyone from the audience wants to come in on, on, on this subject of migration at this moment. Yeah, gentlemen there. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about the EU on being involved in this, this, this situation with these people. I'd like to refer them as people rather than to the migrants, of, which is a horrible yeah, yeah, yeah. name to be called. But really, it's, in, it's a United Nations issue, and yeah. Jeremy stated that at the beginning. It is a United Nations issue, and everybody shouldn't get, get involved to stop this appalling abuse. Do you agree with that? Mm. Well, there, mm. there's a global question, isn't there? But there's also what's happening in Europe, and we are part of the European yeah, but Union. The, the, I'm not being funny, but the likes yeah. of... Where's, where's the US 
bother anyone with this. Where's the likes of the Arab countries dealing with the, like, this, likes of Kuwait yeah. and such? What, what, what are they doing? Yeah. What pressure has been put onto them? Should, would you put pressure on other countries to take that support okay, forward? Okay, lady there. <laughs> it seems ironic that what we're saying now is that we need countries to work together, and yet we have a referendum in a couple of years um, which would render Absolutely. our ability to work with others to be reduced to zero. Here. Right, okay. Let's, Let's go. Let's go. Such an important issue. If you think about the huge challenges we face in this country over migration, over issues like climate change, trade in the global economy, if we pull out of Europe, think of the devastation that would make for jobs, inward investment, trade, but also tackling issues like migration. You know, it is absolutely right that you know, Alan Johnson is leading a Labour Yes campaign, but he needs to be backed by a strong Labour leader who campaigns for a Yes vote for us to remain part of it. I believe that I am the strongest pro-European candidate in this contest, and I think it is essential that we go out and make the positive case for Europe, first, last and always. Mr Corbyn, are you a strong pro-European? I'm concerned about the way the European Union is increasingly operating like a free market across Europe, tearing up the social chapter, damaging working class and workers' interests across Europe, hiding tax evasion in Luxembourg and other places, and secretly negotiating so a transatlantic... Can I finish? Yeah. Secretly <laughs> negotiating a transatlantic trade and investment partnership. I think we as a party need to be making strong demands of defending and expanding the social chapter, defending and expanding workers' rights across Europe, and chasing down these uh, approved tax havens that exist by the European Union all across Europe, and asking some serious questions about the way they've treated the people of Greece and other countries by their imposition of austerity measures on them. Right. OK. Well, we seem so how to be, are you going to uh, change it if you're out of it? And well, the people who are undermining the uh, social chapter is the Tories being dragged well, to the right by their own backbenchers. This back is benches. why the point I'm making is that Britain ought to be defending those social gains. We, as the Agreed. Labour Party, should yeah, be making are. demands on yep. this Agreed. rather than leaving doing. it to Cameron to go away and tear up, this, tear up the social chapter Europe. and tear up an awful lot of environmental protection and other issues and also the way in which TTIP is being negotiated. I think we want a social Europe, a Europe of solidarity. What we're in danger of getting with Cameron's negotiations is a Europe of free market and very little social protection for anybody. We have been around this before. I think we are likely to come back to the European question, but, but, but just to end this section, just a quick comment from you, Just re yeah. briefing on that. Look, we've got to reform Europe. It's a terrible the way Germany has been treating Greece, but Britain should have been in there arguing for a better deal for Greece. Yeah. Where was David Cameron? He should be in there. But I the said problem, exactly I think, the disagreement, But the disagreement between us, Jeremy, is I agree, we have got to strongly reform Europe, and we need Europe to be doing far more on a series of issues. But if we pull back, if we just stand on the sidelines and shout, all that happens is we will be affected by the decisions taken in Europe. We will be unable so, to change change things, we'll be unable to get a better deal and for we, Greece because we'll okay. just, 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 just to uh, add a final comment on this. We could actually only be a year away, to be honest, from a European referendum, a year away. And this referendum will be the definitive moment uh, in politics for a generation, I believe, in this country. And I don't believe the Labour Party can come out of this leadership election and have any room for ambivalence or equivocation about our position with respect to Europe. I want to lead a pro-European party from day one, making the argument that it is in the interest of jobs in the north-east of England and across the country right. to stay in the European Union. Okay. It is not perfect, but Labour should always make the pro-European argument and win that referendum. All right. So let's uh, take another question uh, from the audience here. This one comes from Biju uh, Kotecha. Would you be willing to compromise your political principles in order to get elected? Right. Would you be willing to compromise your political principles uh, in order to get elected? Andy Byrne. Um <laughs> No is the answer. Uh, no is the answer to that. And, you know, I'll pick up an issue that came up, actually, in, in the summer where we had a debate on George Osborne's welfare bill where I said in Shadow Cabinet twice, I was the only person in shadow, who was in the, of the candidates in Shadow Cabinet to say that we should oppose it. And I believe that is still the case, and I still will oppose it. I will. 
But then people say to me, well, why didn't you resign? My principles, my Labour principles, go back to that motto that's underpinned our movement for generations, that unity is strength, that you have to stand together, you have to be a united force. So as much as I had huge misgivings about what the party was proposing, I've always put the party first, if you like, so that we can then put the country first. So, yeah, that was, a, that was difficult, and that's what happens when you're in shadow cabinet or cabinet. But I hope people can see in me, because of the work I've done over the years on issues like Hillsborough, I have always put the people first and my principles first, and that is the kind of Labour leader that I will be. I will always make my arguments in private. I will support whatever the party agrees in public. But the reason I'm standing to be leader of the Labour Party is because, actually, I think the Labour Party has lost sight of its own principles. The fact that it couldn't take a view on a bill of that kind tells you how far we have lost our way. This Labour Party needs to get its principles back. I want to give all of you in this room a Labour Party you can believe in and be proud of again. Liz Cameron. In answer to your question, no. And throughout this contest, I have, I believe, told the truth about why I think we lost the election and how we need to change to win in 2020. And I believe in sound public finances because I don't think it's right to be spending more on servicing your debt than educating your children. I believe that the public didn't vote for us because they didn't trust us on the economy or with their taxes, but I'm actually making that case from a position of principle. We need to change our economy so we have a real long-term strategy for the future. And the way that we get skills and jobs in future is going to be different from the past. And I also believe that one of the reasons we lost is people didn't trust us on welfare. And I believe in real welfare reform. I don't want to see 95% of government spending going on housing benefit and only 5% on house building. I don't want to see £30 billion going on tax credits to subsidise low pay when we could be getting the high skill, high wage jobs of the future. And I want to see real reform of the state. We waste billions of pounds on picking up problems after they've, they've happened in the health service, in prison and in education. We need to shift the focus and have real reform of our public services so they get better results and better value for money. I make that case not simply because I want to appeal to the electorate, but it's by winning that we put our principles into practice. I actually believe that Labour needs to change, apply our principles to the world as it is and it will be, not to the problems of the past. Awesome. I suppose there's always a problem that if you don't compromise, you might not get elected. <laughs> well, I think what you don't com compromise on your principles, but you do have to work hard to be able to put them into practice. And I think there is a myth that's been going around at the moment that somehow the Labour Party has to choose right now between our principles and between getting into power, that we have to choose between our heads and our hearts. And actually, we can't do that with the Labour Party. Our whole purpose from our very founding was in order to put our principles into practice. If all we do is shout from the sidelines, we won't change anything. We can't just be angry at the world. We've got to change the world. But I think we can be confident enough in our values. It's what we've been doing and what a lot of people have been doing across the country talking about the refugees and those issues this week. It's also what we do when we talk about equality, when we talk about fighting child poverty. I think we can be proud of our values, but also be strong enough to persuade people to argue, to build up the consensus and support behind them so that we can win. Let's both stand up for our principles and put them into practice. Jeremy Corbyn. Principles are very important. The principles of social justice, the principle of democracy, the principle of accountability, the principle of defending human rights and all our liberties are crucial. But we also, as a party, have to face up to something which is an unpleasant truth, that we fought the 2015 election on very good policies included in the manifesto, but fundamentally we were going to be making continuing cuts in central government expenditure, we were going to continue underfunding local government, there were still going to be job losses, there were still going to be people um, suffering because of the cuts we were going to impose by accepting an arbitrary date to move into budget surplus, accepting the language of austerity. My suggestion is that the party has to challenge the politics of, a, of austerity, the politics of increasing the gap between the richest and the poorest in our society and be prepared to invest in a growing economy <laughs> rather than 
rather than accepting what has been foisted upon us by the banking crisis of 2008-9. We don't have to set this arbitrary date, which in effect means the poorest and most vulnerable in our society pay for the banking crisis rather than those that caused it. I mean, do you think... <laughs> Do you think you, you on the platform share a common set of principles, Labour principles? Yes, I believe yeah, we, do. we do. We yeah. all want, we all believe in a more equal society. We believe in human rights mm. and solidarity. Yeah. But there are different ways of achieving your principles. And I believe, you know, John Prescott was right when he says traditional yeah. Labour values in a modern setting and the solutions we need for today and tomorrow aren't going to be the I same as they were in the 1980s. We also not really well, except we disagree. disagree. As, a party, <laughs> as a party at times, I think our problem is, and it goes back to the issue I was just talking about, we've put presentation before our principles. You know, we've kind of been worried about what the Tory papers will say about us. So we then give too much support, in my view, to things like free schools and academies. Or, as Jeremy rightly said, we didn't set out an alternative to George Osborne's punishing austerity because we weren't prepared to use the word tax and say, yes, we should have a more balanced plan to reduce the deficit. This is, I think, our problem, to be honest, as a Labour Party. When we knock on those doors at election time, what's the thing we hear time and again? There's no point. You're all the same. And the people out there are waiting for a Labour Party to wake up again. And that's what we've got to do. Well, that's, that's, that's Mr. Cotecha. What do you think? Do you think it's worth compromising to get power? Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't intended to be an either-or question. I think distinctive, uh, powerful, proud principles do get you elected eventually. I think mm. the powerful messages are, in fact, really, really important. Um, I think there's always going to be some compromise that they need to kind of compromise to be able to run a good government. Um, and... At the softer edges, you need to be able to bring most of the people with you. And obviously, the key thing is as well from the last election was that yeah. we're going to have to be able to get back the voters that we lost, yeah. the left-leaning voters that went to the went to the Greens, the disaffected that went to, the, to went to UKIP, um, and all those voters that we lost um, or, or remained actually with the uh, with the Tories. So, uh, compromise is going to be important because we need to be inclusive and we need to obviously win next time and, and not lose. So. Yeah. so <laughs> Yeah, it, that's really important because in the end this has got to be about real hope not false promise and in the mm. end I think that's probably my biggest disagreement with Jeremy is that we would agree that we should have an alternative to George Osborne's austerity of 40% cuts that is what he is talking about now that is not about good economics that is about an ideology of austerity which is about shrinking our public services but where we would disagree is I don't think that alternative comes from printing money I think okay. that alternative has to be a credible, strong Labour alternative, because that is the way we can both be true to our principles and also be credible enough to win. I wanted to come back to the point you made about... Um, you talked about winning back voters, including those who maybe had been Labour and then voted Conservative, places like Watford, where I grew up. But I don't think that that is compromising to want to appeal to those voters. I think... We should be a party that wants to speak to the vast majority of people in this country. And one of the issues about the last election was that whilst we rightly campaigned to scrap the bedroom tax, abolish the hours contracts and raise the minimum wage, if you weren't on the minimum wage, maybe you owned your own home or ran a business or were self-employed, we just had too little to say. And it isn't just because we need those voters to get it elected. I want us to be a party that does stand and represent the many not the few. OK, well, on that uh, quotation, let's go to our next question, which comes uh, from Alan Burkett here. Mr Burkett. Yep, here we are. I'll wait for the microphone. Yeah. OK. Are you all right? Right. Um, I'd like to know... Um, I'm slightly deviating from the card, so uh, <laughs> apologies for that. I'm particularly looking forward to Jeremy's um, answer. Why are the Labour Party members who still openly admire Tony Blair sometimes treated like outsiders in the party and marginalised? <laughs> Mr Corbyn. Well, Why everybody do... in the Labour Party should be treated with respect and their views should be treated with respect. I have some pretty fundamental differences with Tony Blair on economic and uh, some global issues, but th there's no secret about that. There are people in the Labour Party... I mean, Party... do you admire Tony Blair? <laughs> I, dis <laughs> I, I so fundamentally disagree with Tony Blair over Iraq and over the way that he conducted himself in the lead-up to the Iraq war 
and the close relationship we developed with George Bush that uh, uh, I recognized there were achievements during his time as Prime Minister. I was very happy to vote for the Minimum Wage Law, the Human Rights Act, the Equalities Act, Disability Discrimination Act, uh, Sure Start, Children's Centres, all those issues, but I think he made such a tragic mistake. His history will always be the question of Iraq and the, and the dishonesty that went with the Iraq decision. <laughs> For some people, like Jeremy and others, the Iraq War does wipe out for them all the good that no, we did as a government. But for me, but for me, I just said a whole lot me, of other things. You said you so profoundly disagreed with him, including on economic <laughs> policy. And I PFI. actually believe being trusted on the economy and being economically credible was one reason why we won and so we could implement the minimum wage, sure start, maternity and paternity pay and leave. And I think the real issue though goes back to the last gentleman's question about do you compromise your principles and I think for too long uh, those of us on the moderate progressive wing of the party allowed us ourselves to be portrayed as only interested in winning when in fact it was about realising our principles, and I think that's been part of the problem. Andy Burnham. I do find some of the way the discourse around this leadership election has been conducted between different sides of the party quite worrying, to be honest with you. You know, to direct all of this anger at a man who won three uh, general elections for us and say that he doesn't have a right to speak out, I mean, that is obviously a ridiculous thing uh, for people to say. Yeah, Tony made mistakes, but so does every politician, and over, overall... We did a lot of things to change this country for the better, and everybody does need to remember that. But it, this brings me to, suppose, to my main point. I, I am worried, given the kind of nature of some of the debate that we've seen, this party could go into a period of infighting coming out of this leadership election. We could repeat the mistakes of the 1980s, where we were more interested in fighting each other, and we left the pitch clear for Margaret Thatcher to bulldoze her way through communities across the North East, the North of England, and the whole country. And if Labour does that again coming out of this, we will make a terrible mistake. We will let down millions of people out there who are losing their tax credits, who are having their disability benefits cut, young people who can't get on in life. You know, if Labour turns in on itself coming out of this because of these fights and these people more interested in fighting each other than the real enemy of the Tory, then we will make a huge mistake. It's why I say I've never been a factional politician. I believe I can unite Labour coming out of this contest, and that is what we need to do. Stop fighting each other, fight the Conservatives, stand up for people who are being hit hard by them. Yvette Cooper. In the end, this is not going to be a next election that is about looking back to 1997 or to the 1980s or to beyond. We're not going to win the next election. We're not going to have the radical ideas of the future actually just by looking back to our past and becoming an inward-looking party and looking back to that. We have got to be able to have a robust and honest debate about different ideas and different ideas for the future without that being about personalities, without that being about division, and without us having the tensions and disagreements between us as we do so. And it is really important that we can come together as part of this, because that is what we did when we were first founded. When we first came together as the Labour Party, you know, you had the Marxists and the Methodists, you had the Cooperative and the Trade Union Movement and the Fabians all coming together, because, to be honest, we were fed up of losing, and we were fed up of not being able to change anything. And that is why we want to reach out, and it's not just about all of our party that we're reaching out and making sure that everybody can feel part of a strong party. We want to reach out across the country as well, because we want more people to be supporting the Labour Party for the future. We can only get more people to support us if we're also prepared to be strong enough and united enough ourselves. Do you think if you become leader, Jeremy Corbyn, that the party will be able to unite around you? I mean, unnamed, unattributed... Supporters of yours are talking about deselecting people like Tristram Hunt, for the example, as MPs. Party membership is now the biggest it's ever been. The numbers of people taking part in this election are the biggest there's ever been for a party election at any time in British history. The enthusiasm and interest in this is something that people should understand. And my suggestions are the party needs to look at the issues of how we address the economic question in the last election, and I pointed that in my last question on austerity, but also about how the party operates. We have top-down decision-making and top-down policy-making. I want to see that basically reversed. I've also, as part of and this does campaign... Does that mean marginalising MPs in the parliamentary party? No. 
you'd start with the strengths and ideas and enthusiasm and intelligence of the members and activists in the party who've got very good ideas about how we do things, and you have a process where that goes upwards rather than downwards from the top. I think that is actually something that's very important. How the party does its business is uh, important because it gives people well, confidence in how that party's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Sorry? You want to be party leader, so it's obviously important. Yes, and what I've done in this campaign is put out a whole series of policy consultation ideas because I do think there's a whole need for debate and interest in the party, and that is what this election is bringing it's out. There are people who've got great ideas. Let's hear them rather than having a leader that this party yeah. brings down. Well, that's why we're having Let's go. Without doubt... We have been too centralised a party mm -hmm. in the past and we haven't yeah. drawn on the massive you know, experience, skills and knowledge of our party members. I'd like to see us also involving the public far more too, mm -hmm. those who aren't members of the party, but let's get real. The Tories want to wipe us out. And the minute that the new leader is elected, they're going to throw everything at us. You know, they're trying to take our politics, claiming they're the one name nation party and the party of the low paid. We know they're not, but they know they won't be re-elected if they're still seen as for the privileged few. They want to take our money and our funding from trade unions. That's what they're doing in the trade union legislation. Mm -hmm. And they're going to change the constituencies, reduce the number, do it on individual voter registration, which they're bringing forward by a year. And they're going to whip up English nationalism aided in the betted by the SNP. They want to wipe us out and we've got to get real. We've got to go back on the attack on the Tories. They've had too much space yeah. during this leadership election. We've got to get real. They'll be bringing it on and we need a, le a strong mm. Labour leader who understands what they're going to do and is going to fight back yeah. for Labour so we can win in 2020. Well, our next question is... Uh... <laughs> Relevant uh, to that last point, it comes from uh, Gor Gordon uh, Mabon, or Gordon Marbon, I'm sorry. Mabon. Mabon, Mr Mabon. How do you attract SNP and UKIP supporters back to Labour? How do you attract SNP and UKIP supporters back to Labour? Yvette Coop. Yeah, we do have to reach out. And so we were too narrow at the, next, at the last election. I don't think we'll solve that by just moving our narrow party a bit to the left or our narrow party a bit to the right, because we're going to have to reach out in all directions. In Scotland, that means challenging the uh, SNP, as Kezia Dugdale, our new Scottish leader, has already started doing, and we need to back her in the process, challenging them on actually on their record and on basic things, like you've got kids in Scotland who are losing out. If they come from the most deprived backgrounds, they're getting a worse education. They're getting worse education results. And that's as a result of the decisions that the SNP are making in schools in Scotland. So we've got to be championing Labour's values, having the ideas for the future, and recognise it is going to take time to rebuild. But we've also got to, I think, stand up for that classic principle of Labour solidarity, which is we are stronger when we stand together than if we leave people to sink or swim alone. And we care as much about children who are in poverty in Gateshead as we do children who are in poverty in Glasgow. That is a fundamental Labour principle which we should defend. Andy Bennett. <laughs> do, do, you work, do you work with or against the SNP, for example? Uh, well, in opposition, I think if you can stop the Tories doing things, you, you work uh, with them. But it's different when it comes to government. But let me, let me just deal with the question directly, because, you know... For me, the same underlying reason explains why we've lost votes to the SNP in Scotland and UKIP in England. And it's this. When the public have looked at the Labour Party in recent times, they've seen a party that they can't relate to. It's London-centric. It doesn't speak to them. It doesn't look like the people who are speaking for Labour understand them and their lives. They look out of touch. And the way I put it is, you know, the people of, of England and Scotland haven't drifted away from Labour. Labour has drifted away from them. And this is what we've got to face up to. And I think the way you win them back is not running a different message in Scotland from the one in England. That would be a big mistake. The way you win them back is give them a party they can believe in again, but actually policies of substance and scale that answer the issues that they are worried about. For instance, having a policy at the next election of an affordable and decent home for everybody to rent or to own. I think that would have huge resonance across all parts of the country and, indeed, saying, hasn't rail privatisation been a disaster? Shouldn't we bring the railways back under public control and ownership? Because 
My judgment is, my judgment is the reason we haven't said that in recent times is because Labour's been bowing down before the mantra that the market is the answer to everything. And this is why we've lost a lot of people who don't see what we stand for anymore. This party's got to find the courage of its convictions, stand for things again, things that people can believe in. And if we do that, we will win votes back north and south of the border. Jeremy Corbyn, how do you get votes back from UKIP and the SNP? Only 47% of young voters turned out in the last election. 36% of the entire electorate didn't vote at all. We also lost votes to the SNP in Scotland and we lost votes to UKIP and others in England as well as losing votes to the Greens. I think you confront it by a policy which is clear on the economic way we're going to go forward, clear about reducing the ghastly levels of inequality that exist within our society, clear about the health inequalities and clear that we're going to do something about it rather than blame people for it. And in the case of Scotland particularly, challenge the agenda of privatisation, challenge the privatisation of CalMac ferries, which is now being pushed through by the SNP government, but above all, unite people, unite people on the basis that we can have a fairer, more decent society, but you have to challenge the inequality and challenge that through corporate taxation, challenge that through providing the vital health and social services that all are being cut at the Isn't that time. quite close to what Edmund Aban did in the last election in terms of the appeal. <clears throat> Ed was trying to do that. I think the problem was, as I said earlier, the economic strategy that was being followed. But there is a question about labour traditions and labour values. Those labour traditions and values are about defending trade unions, are about increasing wage levels, are about giving real opportunities to young people, and are about defending the principle of a universal welfare state rather than joining in the, con the attacks on it that happen all the time from some of our newspapers. Liz Kevin, is there something that would bring back, if you like, from both sides, SNP supporters and UKIP supporters? Sometimes I think we overcomplicate politics. I mean, what people in Glasgow or Grimsby or Gateshead want is pretty much the same thing. They want a good job that pays a decent wage, a home to call their own, a safe place to bring up kids, knowing that their children might have a better chance of getting on than they had, and if they're going to retire, that they'll have something to look forward to, enough to live on, and not be frightened of getting ill. And we have to bring it back to what people want. Sometimes, as I said, I don't think that it's that complicated. And this idea that you have a kind of separate strategy for different parts of the country won't wash, because people can smell a rat if you say different things to different people. Mm. But they also want mm. a strong leader, someone who is prepared to say some of the difficult things to their own party and to the country, not just the easy or inspiring things. They want to know that there's someone they can trust and has got the guts and courage to do what's right, no matter what's thrown at them. And I think that's what will convince people right across the country. OK, well, let's uh, ask Mr Maven. Uh, <laughs> do you find the answers in any of that? A little bit in both and all the candidates. Uh, I believe a lot of people believe that they have lost their voice and no one's listening to them anymore. We are unique as a Labour Party. We lost votes to the left and to the right. Yeah. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that people want a party that they can be proud of again. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, gentlemen just there in the front row. The answer is inspiring people. It's, the answer is, is showing that you've got the power of your convictions and you stand up for yourself mm. and you stand up for what you believe in. Um, and that's exactly, Jeremy's said everything that, that I would want to say about how you inspire new people to stand up for... Uh, and, and, and take their vote. You know, it was nearly a third of the electorate didn't bother voting last time. Mm. And it's because everybody mm. looks the same. And no offence, we're all one party, but honestly, you really do look the same. But Jeremy's you know, the really, only really one do. with the we principles. Really, really <laughs> 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 it's certainly the only one with really a beard, don't. anyway. These are the questions that Sky News uh, viewers submitted appropriately on social media, on social affairs. And as you can see, the winner is this from Twitter. Do you support the decriminalisation of medical cannabis? 38% uh, back that. Who wants to start? Mm. Shadow Health Secretary. Shadow Health Secretary, that's a fair point. Uh, there is a case for it in that people who suffer from conditions like multiple sclerosis, I mean, they, they swear by, you know, the, benef the medicinal benefits are, are enormous, but it would have to be highly... 
uh, regulated, in my view, to allow it for medicinal use uh, only. And obviously, that presents all kind of problems. So I understand why people feel so strongly about it. Uh, I would proceed with caution, but I you know, wouldn't be averse to looking at whether, uh, just for medicinal purposes only, whether or not uh, uh, greater flexibility could be allowed. It's yeah, amazing. Cooper. Nobody has asked us that question yeah, for any so of the hustings we have had. I'm not sure quite what it says exactly. Um, no, I think that we have a process for deciding about medicines and safe medicines, and it includes a whole load of drugs that aren't available legally outside the, the, you know, the medicines process. So I think you should just have exactly the same standards apply. If you've got any kind of drug or any kind of thing which has a clear medicinal benefit, then it should go through the normal processes just like any other kind of and do it that way. Please, Kevin. You know, the, so far, the evidence on this, you know, is, is not clear. For many people who are suffering from MS and other conditions, they feel it helps, but many doctors are concerned about some of the problems, particularly for young people and the links with psychosis. And if you're smoking the cannabis for med medicinal purposes, some of the... The implications are the same as if you're smoking tobacco. I think the National Institute for Clinical Excellence is the right body to make any decisions on this. I think there should be proper trials, though, because many people do feel strongly that it makes a difference. I think the jury's out on it so far. Let's have the trials, do it through the normal proper process, and see if we really can make it, uh, make it work. Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think there should be criminalisation of something that is used for medicinal purposes. There's a, a, it's obviously very beneficial to people, particularly those suffering from MS, and I think we should be adult and grown up about it as a society and decriminalise. Decriminalise just, just for medicinal Do, use, yes, indeed. Or not, yes, indeed. not for recreational no. use. That, I think we should have a look at drugs policy as a whole, but I wouldn't advocate that at this stage. I do think it's a case for looking at drugs policy. <laughs> Does anyone else agree that it needs to be a look at drugs policy? Well, uh, certainly uh, legal highs, I think, need to be looked at. We need tough legislation pretty soon because I see in my constituency they are readily available yeah. uh, for a small amount of money. I have had parents come to my surgery, say that their children have just changed overnight having uh, taken them. I think we've allowed a loophole to exist for far too long here and it's been exploited by some very unscrupulous people. There needs to be tough legislation in this area and quickly. Decriminalisation more broadly. I, mean, well, I think, to be honest, we always end up just focusing on the, the legal side of things when the reality is the thing that makes the biggest difference is about treatment. The treatment's being cut back, that's letting people down, that is where the effort should be. I mean, that is, that's absolutely right. I, I agree with uh, Andy on the legal high point. The, the real problem that we have is those preventive services mm. which stop people from taking drugs and alcohol up in the first place or help yeah. them get back on their feet are being cut. And the problem is it's not just terrible for people, but it costs us all far more in the long run. I, I think the government needs to re-look at what it's doing to fund those kind of programmes. It has a huge impact on communities, certainly in my own constituency, and that's got to change. OK. Uh... After that uh, somewhat uh, unexpected question, let's uh, move on to another topic. Uh, and this is in the area of the questions that were submitted by Sky News viewers on foreign affairs. Again, there was a choice of four. And as you can see, the winner in this category is from Alex Ron uh, on Twitter. 39% of the vote wanted to ask the question, should the UK put boots on the ground to tackle ISIS by boots on the ground? Uh, I think that means the deployment of ground forces to deal with ISIS or the so-called uh, Islamic State. Liz Kendall. No, I, I don't think that they should. Look, we are, are hearing that the Prime Minister may come forward with some kind of proposal about military action in Syria. I don't know whether that will happen. My view is that any proposal should be taken seriously, but it would, we would have to be clear about what... UK troops or bombing would add over and above what the US is doing. And it would have to be part of a much 
broader political strategy in the, re in the region, something I talked about earlier. The underlying causes there, the, the schism between Sunni and Shia, how do we actually tackle the funding of ISIL and who they're set selling the oil to? It's got to be part of a wider strategy because anybody who believes that bombing Syria alone or boots on the ground is going to solve the problems we have in that area, I think is sadly mistaken. Andy Barry. <laughs> I agree with much of what Liz has just said. No, I mean, no, at this so point, you, it's so absolutely... So you just let what's happening well, go on happening? This is not where we're, we're at, is it? The question is, should we extend um, air uh, raids into Syria? That's the question. Well, that's, that's the currently, first question. Uh, currently but before that question us, wants to go further. If that other eventuality ever comes down the path, well, it's not for now, and uh, I don't envisage uh, it being an issue in the, in the immediate future. The issue we've got is should we extend airstrikes uh, into Syria? And we're told that this could be a decision within days for the new leader of the Labour Party. And I want to be clear about what, what I would expect. I would say to the Prime Minister, don't disrespect Parliament, but worse, the public and the country, by trying to bounce the new leader of the Labour Party into a decision on something of this significance. You know, going into Syria with airstrikes is, raises all kinds of different questions. There's a legal question, for one. Also, if you do bomb, what do you leave on the ground? Do you leave a vacuum, a void, for ISIL to fill or Al-Qaeda to fill? Uh, this has to be thought through. There has to be time for careful consideration of any proposal to extend uh, military action. Uh, if in years to come there's a further decision about whether Britain should become more involved, well, that is for another day. This is the issue for now. And even this decision needs very careful consideration. There needs to be a process and a timetable set out. And the government should not try to bounce the opposition because that would be disrespectful to the country. If we... If we started bombing now, we'd be killing civilians. We wouldn't necessarily well, do... we are bombing at the moment. Yeah. I mean, we're, we are we're, bombing, we're in, bombing Iraq, in Iraq, and apparently we are taking part in some bombing in Syria, even though the government pretended we're not. Well, and that was a only, pilot, uh... only revealed by Freedom of Information uh, requests. But I do think that the issue would be we'd, we'd bomb, we'd kill people, we wouldn't destroy or defeat ISIS, we would actually probably make a situation considerably yeah. but worse. That's, can I, can that, I just, but that's in a sense where that question yeah. is just, interesting. Where that leads to, then, of course, further, it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if that doesn't work, and I don't think it would, then the question is, would you put boots on the ground? I don't think so. I think what we have to do, and I agree with others on this, is mount a serious political initiative across the entire region, including Turkey, Iran and all the other countries, and ask ourselves some quite hard questions. Where does ISIS get its arms from? Where does it get its money from? Where does it sell its oil to? Who is buying that oil? Why are the borders around so but linky? How do those and questions also, help how you many, solve the current situation? How I mean, many of the arms have we sold to various countries in the region have ended up yes, in the hands of ISIS? I think these are questions that have to be answered. I, I appreciate those are I appreciate those are all matters of concern. Yeah, of course, yeah. we've got the Chilcot Inquiry yeah. asking similar sort of questions about Iraq at the moment. But the, come back to this problem. What do you do about the situation at the moment with uh, IS behaving as it is? You support the refugees that are fleeing. You try to bring about a political process. And interesting, I actually agree with the Foreign Secretary on this point, that he went to Tehran to reopen the embassy there. And I have real concerns about human rights in Iran, but nevertheless, there has to be a relationship with Iran. And he made the point that since this agreement may be successful with the USA, there's a real possibility you can bring about a proper political dialogue across the entire region that involves everybody except ISIL. That provides some possibilities and some hope. Bombing, I think, would make the situation worse, more deaths would follow, more horrors would follow, and more people might end up being attracted towards ISIL and see them as a victim as a result of it. It's a very dangerous situation. There's no easy, palatable answers, but we've got to start somewhere of recognising how ISIL grew and try and cut off their supplies and cut off their funds. Liz Campbell. I've already answered that. Liz has answered already. I've I already haven't, answered Adam. No, you haven't. I'm sorry. OK, you can go now. Because <laughs> we all look the same. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't put words into my mouth, please. No, I, I thought you'd all had a go. No. I'm sorry. 
Liam, I, I think we shouldn't have uh, UK troops on the ground. I don't think that would be the right approach. I don't think it would help. I don't think there's any evidence that that would help circumstances mm. at all. The response on the ground, and there does need to be a response on the ground, because we can't kid ourselves, ISIL is a barbaric and totalitarian movement, and we should be working as part of supporting the region to combat it and not just think that a few nice negotiations are going to work. That is not the kind of organisation that we are dealing with. However, it's got to be led by the region itself. It's got to be led by uh, Iraq, where they have, uh, you know, ISIL is operating within Iraq by the Kurdish forces by the neighbouring forces in the region, and our role should be to support them in doing so. In terms of uh, in Iraq, we have been invited by a democratically elected Iraqi government to support them with targeted airstrikes because they are struggling to hold back a barbaric regime. And when they have asked for our help to defend their democracy, I think we should support yeah. them in doing so. But Syria I... is different. Syria is completely different because there you've got Assad and you've got ISIL and it is a much more complicated situation yeah. and it is not clear how the same strategy works at all. But for us to turn our backs yeah. on an elected democracy that asks for our help in a targeted way, yeah. I think would be wrong. But I just want to come to, come to that, <laughs> that issue which Andy Berman raised, which is the possibility of a vote in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. You're all MPs uh, coming up on whether to extend uh, the uh, bombing to include uh, British planes uh, operating above Syria as well. Would you vote for that in any circumstance? I think Syria is very different from Iraq. It's not unclear whether any action that you take there, whether it helps Assad, whether it helps ISIL, it's much more complex. And I've not yet seen anything from the Prime Minister, from the British government, about what it is they think they would achieve by any kind of intervention in Syria. So, look, when the, the government puts forward things, you've got to be a responsible opposition and you've got to look very carefully at anything that they come forward with. But I think there's some very big questions for the Prime Minister but, but to it, answer you wouldn't until that... Uh, I don't think it's right to rule out things when the government hasn't put things would forward. You However, there's some big questions for them to answer. No, but as I said, you'd have to have a clear objective, know how any UK involvement, as I said, uh, added to what yeah. the US was already doing, and it had to be part of a broader political yeah. strategy in the region. Would, would, no, like Liz, but I would proceed with the utmost caution. And the bigger context here for this party and the next leader is the publication of the Chilcot report that you mentioned, because that will be a sobering moment for this party, and we will need to be seen to take on board its findings, put them at the heart of Labour policy going forward. You know, the idea that this party can just go along with a, with a push. You know, Ed Miliband, to be fair, was right to stand up uh, to uh, oppose military action in Syria in the summer of 2013. He was right to do that. And, and, I, and, I, and I think we need to have in our mind all the time that we need to proceed with great caution and learn the lessons of the last decade. Ms Corbyn, would you, as Labour leader, rule out the possibility of voting in support of extending bombing into Syria? Yes, because I want to see a different political solution in the area. I want to see a different approach to the question in the yeah. region, and particularly the economic issues. And I'd also say to those that say you can do... I know, no, I know a number of my colleagues have said this, but those that do say you could do sort of limited bombing, as soon as you get involved in military action, something called mission creep takes over, and we'll find ourselves yeah. deeply embedded in that, and then there will be a huge demand of sending ground troops as well. I think there has to be... Be, I think would. there has to be a regional political solution, and that's the, yeah. the issue that I would press at the present time. Now, <laughs> and, and, and as party leader, how would you apply it to that vote if you did become party leader? I mean, would it be a three-line whip saying we're going to vote we'd, against We'd this? have to debate it, we'd have to discuss it. I hope the majority of Labour MPs would go along with that position. I hope all Labour MPs would go along with that position. When we opposed the bombing of Syria in 2013, there was uh, there were some who didn't agree with the position Ed Miliband did. The majority of us did and supported it. On other votes, there have been differences. Yes, there are always going to be differences yeah. on crucial issues. MPs have a responsibility yeah. to take decisions because it is a very important job. Uh, and and would, would the rest of you accept Can I just a, say, a common position? Is there position? any circumstance in which you would, would deploy Britain's military forces? Any? I'm sure there are some, but I can't think of them at the moment. <laughs> not, not the Falklands, certainly. You didn't in Kosovo not, either. Not, not the Falklands. Well, I, in the question of Kosovo, we ended up with um, 
Yes, a dreadful situation in Kosovo. We also did an excessive amount of bombing in Serbia, which did cause a lot of problems. I'm not, I think the UN should have been more strongly supported in the very beginning, and it was the failure of the UN uh, and its forces that actually led to the much greater and much greater danger there. And I think there wasn't enough support given to the UN in the first place. But do you think we did the wrong thing in Kosovo? I mean, because I think, look, there was a huge... I mean, we effectively ended up with, with genocide Indeed, in the region. Huge, we had huge abuse of human rights, and there was yeah. a real humanitarian crisis. So I think we were right to intervene in Kosovo and in the Balkans, and I think will have saved a lot of lives as a result. It is difficult, it's very difficult to have any kind of military intervention, but I don't think you can rule it out when you have humanitarian crises in place. I, I don't rule it out. What I do say is that the UN mission should have been more strongly and more effectively supported in the very beginning. It wasn't, it was, it was significantly undermined, and eventually that paved the way for NATO going in, which then decided on what was actually a quite heavy bombing campaign against various places in Serbia, some of which were not necessarily military targets. I think we should have stuck with the UN and the UN proposal to it and given far more support to the UN, because surely we want to live in a world that's based on the, on the rule of international law, and the UN is quintessentially part of international law. You are, there is a, a quote from you in the Sun newspaper today from a, a video you did uh, where you really questioned the need for an armed forces on the scale that we have it in this country even after recent cuts. Would, would you stand by those remarks? I don't know what the remarks are because I don't buy the Sun newspaper. <laughs> But, but you might remember call, recording a video that, uh, according to The Sun, you did on behalf of the Communist Party, uh, in, which, <laughs> in, in which you questioned the need for aircraft carriers, you questioned the need for Britain to have uh, a place on the international stage in terms of armed forces. Uh, did, you, did you make remarks of that kind? I think we have to have, and we are having, a strategic defence review. I do think we have to think about the level of armed expenditure we have in this country, £35 billion pounds per year. We are in the top five of military spending across the whole world. I think we have to seriously look at those issues and look at the issues of nuclear weapons as well, and also what our foreign policy objectives actually are. Oh. And so I'm suggesting we have both a strategic defence review yeah. and a foreign policy review at the same time. Okay. Can we afford to have global reach of a country well, of 65 million people on the northwest coast of Europe? Should we not be more interested in supporting international law, working with the UN, well, rather than deciding that we, as quite a small okay. country, can yes. actually afford this global okay. intervention? Okay. That's, that's pretty much... <laughs> I've got to say that's pretty much what the Sun quoted you as saying. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, Do you but, buy but, the but, Sun? But, 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 <laughs> but bearing, bearing that in mind, on an important issue, putting together defence and security, do you think Britain should seek to maintain its permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council? Well, the seat on the Security Council is not based on military expenditure or on the holding of it's nuclear weapons. It's just a coincidence it's a that they're the five nuclear historical... powers, is it? Wait a minute. It's, that's coincidental, because originally they didn't all have nuclear weapons. It's, a, it's coincidental yeah. to that. I do think there needs to be reform of the UN to expand the Security Council to ensure there is but a permanent Britain African, Latin American nation. should seek to maintain its permanent seat on the Security Council? Yes, of course. But, but if, if, of NATO? If, if, that is, uh, if that is what um, the UN reforms bring about, I think okay. they will retain the existing five members, probably expand to other permanent members. And you support I mean, that? It's a little, yes, I do. Yeah. Because I do you were think just saying you're questioning Britain's role on the world stage. No, I question the level of military expenditure okay. and why we have this global role for ourselves. Um, and I question whether or not we shouldn't just think about these things. Okay. Other countries think quite seriously about this. I think it's time for us to have that discussion and have those thoughts. OK. But other countries do... Let's... <laughs> Sorry, what was that? You're grilling him and the string of the
I, I suspect yeah. your positions are well yeah. known. You think Britain should maintain its position on the on the UN security? I think we have to be part yeah. of both, not just the UN, but also okay. part of NATO and part of the EU. Right. I think there's a fundamental part of our Labour Party from our very beginning, which was to be an internationalist party. And my worry is that actually, if you talk about pulling out of NATO, if you talk about prevaricating over the EU, if you talk about shrinking ourselves inwards, we lose that internationalism that has been an important right. part of whether it's and standing up for human rights, whether it's part of development across the world, that internationalism has I, to stay at Andy the heart Brad. of our party. Um, I, agree, I agree with what Yvette has just said. And given the way the world is and the issues that we've been talking about, the unpredictability that we see, the, the insecurity, the instability, is now really the time for Britain to drop its defences? I honestly don't think it is. I don't think we can be sure enough about what the future okay. holds to say we can take, take a step into the unknown. So, yes, Security Council, we keep our seat. NATO, we retain our membership. These are differences between myself and Jeremy, but I'm quite clear the security yeah. of this country comes first. Yes, Kendall. The security of the country does come first, and it's one of the reasons why at the start of this leadership campaign I said that the Prime Minister should keep his promise to our NATO allies of spending 2% of GDP on defence. We face such risks and instability in the world. But the truth is, you know, we can't be a country that thinks we can somehow pull up the drawbridge and hope the rest of the world goes away. What happens in other countries affects us here. I had two of my constituents killed on the beach in Tunisia, um, murdered. And, you know, we've seen from the migration crisis what happens elsewhere affects us here. And the idea that we as a country can achieve our national security in its broadest sense by withdrawing with, from the world rather than engaging with it, I think is profoundly wrong. OK. <laughs> Let's go back to domestic affairs now, and our next question comes uh, from uh, Mark Lyndon-Smith. Yeah. Good evening, candidates. Uh, I would like to ask all of you, um, how important do you think faith schools are for the future of our education system in this country? How important do you think faith schools are uh, for the future of our country? Uh, Andy Burnham. Well, I think they are important. I went to one, a Catholic school. My children go to a Catholic comprehensive. They're part of our tradition. They're part of the way education has developed uh, in this country. I always felt the values I got from that education and Catholic social teaching are part of my politics, to be honest. So that is me, and that's my background. I wouldn't deny my background. But I tell you what I do believe in when it comes to education, comprehensive education. I believe in it with every fibre of my being. All kids together, all backgrounds together, seeing life from all sides, a breadth of opportunity in the curriculum. That is what I stand for. I believe that that is the best way to educate our children. And I hate this approach where we break down the system into free schools and academies that aren't accountable to their local community, but accountable to London. How is that the best way to run an education system where we say you can have unqualified teachers in the classroom, no application of the national curriculum? I think this man, Mr Gove, has done more damage to the education system in England than any other person before him. And I had a you know, shocking moment when Michael Gove became Justice Secretary and said that he was going to... Um, actually, he opposed taking away books from prisons. And I thought, oh, my God, I suddenly agree with Michael Gove on something for the first time ever, because I completely disagree with him and with his approach to education. Um, I think, look, faith schools, there are some really good faith schools across Britain, and we want lots of good schools across the country. My concern about the government's approach is that they, what they've actually done is centralise everything. And whether it is through their free schools, which end up being in areas which don't need additional places, whether it is through the way in which they've approached the academy programme, it's all centralised. If you are a local parent and you are worried about what is going on in the local school, who do you call? Nikki Morgan? I mean, I think she's going to be busy. You know, it's going to be hard to get proper answers about your local school. So I think, look, support good schools, but also make sure we have proper local accountability again, so that local communities can have a say about their schools. Yes, Kenya. There are some many superb faith schools, including in my own constituency, but I represent a very diverse city. Leicester, very proud to do so. And we work very hard, actually, to build strong relationships between our different faiths and emphasise what we have in common rather than what divides us. Mm. Without doubt, 
we need much stronger accountability in the school system. And Yvette is right to say so much is centralised at the moment. That's wrong. I don't know how a Secretary of State can keep a real focus on the quality and standards in schools mm. if everything is just done centrally. But honestly, <clears throat> I think we have got to get away from this obsession with structures in schools. You know, my mum was a primary school teacher. And I know from what I've seen in my own constituency in my background that what makes a great school is an inspiring head, brilliant teachers. You've got enough flexibility in the curriculum to really grasp what is it that inspires kids and to use that to hook them in and, and give them the confidence that they need to succeed. We need a big reform, in my view, of the curriculum, particularly between age 14 and 19. We've got to get, finally, some equality between vocational and academic education. We've got to prepare kids for the world as it is out there and have a fully rounded education. And we have got to start very, very early. You know, we always talk rightly about primaries and secondaries, but by the time disadvantaged children start school, they are up to 20 okay. months behind where they should be in their development. That's where we've got to put the focus. Jeremy Corbyn, faith schools, good idea. Faith schools are absolutely part of the landscape and uh, they are doing a very good job in many cases. The caveat I would put on is that I want all faith schools to ensure that they do ensure that all their pupils understand the multiplicity of faiths in our society, that Catholic schools teach Islam, Islamic schools teach uh, Christianity and so on, so that all of our children grow up understanding the multi-faith and multicultural society in which they live. And indeed, many of them do this. One of the best descriptions I've heard of the fundamentals of Islam was actually in a girls' Catholic school in my constituency when I was observing lessons there. And I was very impressed with the way they put it forward because I don't want all of our communities to grow up in silos because we all know where that leads to in the end. I want young people to grow up together. And I also agree with my colleagues on this that we need to re-empower local education authorities to bring together the family of local schools rather than this frankly ludicrous idea that with all the brilliance of Michael Gove, even he couldn't possibly know what's going on in every secondary school in every part of Britain. I don't think even his brain capacity is <laughs> capable of doing that. The clock is against us, so we're going to have a, a slight uh, change of tack now, an opportunity for the candidates to directly question their opponents. And we ask them to submit their questions to us in advance, and we've uh, assembled a round robin. First, uh, we have a question from Jeremy Corbyn to Liz Kendall. <laughs> well, Liz, um... <laughs> I, I can't read it over there. I can't, uh, it would be discourteous to turn around and read it behind You've me. You've said but, you share the are you same... It? Yes, I have. <laughs> After this election is over, We've obviously got huge issues to face in the party, and I believe we have to have very fundamental party debates. Uh, I hope everybody can work together to achieve that. Do you think that we need to develop our economic strategy so we actually have my suggestion of a national investment bank that could help to bring about the necessary investment in infrastructure and housing and all the crucial things that we need in this country to promote economic development? And the question is... The question is, if we it's we gone, gone from the screen, we could, we, we, could we work together after the election? So you, are you advising us to work together. with you? Um, of course, I work with everybody. I'm a very inclusive sort of chap. <laughs> um, I will uh, hopefully, um, you know, I'll be elected leader of the Labour Party, but I would work with whoever is elected in this, in this contest because I believe our party is the you know, best champion of equality and opportunity well, what, what this country has, has ever seen. Does that mean joining a, a shadow cabinet, for No, example? I've said very straightforwardly, I wouldn't... Not that Jeremy or anybody else has offered anybody in this contest jobs, because we're not taking the votes for granted. Still a third of the people haven't voted. You know, we're out to fight for every last vote that we can get. But um, I don't agree with the policies that Jeremy has put forward. I don't believe that the solution to jobs and growth in this region is, you know, saying we should renationalise vast swathes of the economy or print money or reopen the coal mines. I don't believe that's right. And honestly, people are sick of people just, you know, saying things they don't believe in. No, none of you would believe me if I suddenly backed all of those policies, but I will always work for the Labour Party to put our principles into practice. But the fundamentals of this don't change. You know, unless we regain people's trust on the economy or with their taxes, we won't have a hope in hell of winning in 2020. So that's a maybe, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you work with me, Jeremy? 
Cool. OK, it's your turn now, uh, Ms Kendall. Your question for Andy Burnham. Andy. Yes, Liz. <laughs> you said there could be a woman leader of the Labour Party when the time is right. When exactly will that be? I also, uh, I also said that the time could be now at the, same, uh, at the same time. And it could, of course it could. Uh, two brilliant candidates uh, in, this, in this race. Uh, but it's got to be the right person. Gender can't be the only consideration, can it? This is a massive responsibility, isn't it, that we're all uh, seeking to take on, to lead this party of ours forward when we've lost so much support in Scotland, a catastrophic loss of, loss of support. We've lost voters to UKIP. We've lost votes to the Tories. I mean, the Labour Party stands at this moment at a very dangerous uh, crossroads, and it's got to be the person that can, that can reach out, that can touch all of those communities, can rebuild trust in Labour, make Labour a party people can believe in again. And the voters in this election have got to choose who is the person uh, best placed to do that. And a lot of factors need to come into consideration before that person is chosen. But you'd cope with a woman, Andy. Yeah, I said that. Uh, no, I think the time is... You know, I might be a bit biased, but I think the time <laughs> is right for our party to elect a woman leader, but, but also a woman leader who, as I said, is tough enough to say the difficult things as well as the inspiring yep. ones, and who is focused on winning in 2020, beating the Tories, kicking them out, and I think I'm the best person okay. for the job. All right, well, everyone gets to answer a question. Everyone gets to ask one. So, Andy Burnham, your question to Yvette Cooper. Um, Yvette, I think we'd all agree that Jeremy has brought a lot of energy uh, to this race, to say the least. It's the power uh, of youth. It's uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been a long race, hasn't it? So long that I can just about remember being the front runner at one point in this, uh, in this race. However, Jeremy's brought a lot of energy to this race, and I've said as leader that I would involve uh, Jeremy and his team uh, in my team, but you've said you wouldn't. So, with that, how could you unite the Labour Party if you weren't, if you were going to push Jeremy and his supporters away? I don't think this is about pushing people away at all, because I think you're right. This has got to be about uniting the party and all of the ideas from across the party. I think, look, I'm being really careful not to start, you know, drawing up shadow cabinets yeah, before exactly. a third of the party have even voted. And I don't think anybody should be taking for granted this leadership election. There's an awful lot to play for. There's a lot of people still voting, and that's what we should be arguing about. Well, look, you know, we Good said answer. it's the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Jeremy and I have sort of disagreed on, on all sorts of different things, and um, I know Jeremy has. Um, Jeremy's not wanted to be a team player in the past, shall we say, having voted against the party about 500 times, I think, in Parliament. But look, you know, I've in terms of our conscience. common values, we have so a lot you, Jeremy, in so common. Do you in terms of tackling, you know, in terms of dealing with things like human rights, in terms of tackling homelessness, in terms of the belief in the core equality of the Labour Party. So I think we can have an honest debate in which we can be quite robust about the issues that we disagree on and, you know, not pretending to agree with people just in order to kind of try and get their votes, be honest about the issues that we disagree on, but also be honest and proud about the values that we share. OK, Yvette Cooper, it is your turn and your question is to... Uh... Jeremy Corbyn. So it is. So it is. Um, so, Jeremy, so there's issues that we agree on, and uh, Jeremy's trying, you're trying to look for another camera to, to see the, read the question. There are issues that we agree on that we should have, that we should oppose George Osborne's 40% cuts. But the, you know, the issue that I've raised concern with you about is your proposal for the Bank of England to print money to pay for schools or transport. In those circumstances, do you believe that the government would have to pay that money back to the Bank of England, or do you think that this is free money? We put £385 billion worth of money called quantitative easing into the banks to bail them out in 2008. Um, <clears throat> we bought bank shares and put them in a holding company, some of which Osborne is now selling off, and he shouldn't because they're not his to sell, they're ours to keep. And um, my suggestion is that some of that quantitative easing ought to be made available together with other sources such as government bonds to fund a national investment bank so that we have a growing economy which can improve the infrastructure in all parts of the UK, particularly the rail infrastructure, also be able to fund the very necessary housing 
building, particularly council house building, that this country desperately is crying out for. And it's efficient and effective and inexpensive way of funding public investment rather than the private finance initiatives which have been pursued by both this government and the last government, which are costing so much, so dear, in both the NHS and in education. It's not inflationary. Japan used quantitative easing after 10 years of a flatlining economy in order to boost growth. I would have thought it's a sensible and reasonable precautionary thing to do. Well, you, haven't answered, you haven't answered the question. Yes, I have. Because actually, no, you haven't. Because actually what you're offering people is false hope. For a start, no, quantitative... Absolutely well, let me finish. Not. For a start, quantitative easing has stopped because the economy is now growing. The reason that Japan was able to keep going and doing it for many years is because they went into slump, serious slump yeah. for a long term. Yeah. It's absolutely right to support the economy when it is in crisis and when it is in a mm -hmm. serious recession. But once the economy is growing, if you simply keep printing money at that time, that pushes up inflation. Second thing is that when the Bank of England prints that money, and even through the quantitative easing, it has to still be paid back. So actually, you're still not answered. Are the, is the money for the schools and the hospitals or the transport going to have to be paid back? Because my fear is what you're doing is you are offering people false promise. It sounds brilliant. Everybody claps because everybody wants to see the schools, the hospitals, the infrastructure to be done. But if we are really going to be able to deliver the schools, the hospitals, the transport infrastructure, we've got to be credible enough to properly pay for it. We cannot do that if we yeah. just promise to print money we haven't got. It's dishonest. It's false promise. We've got to offer people real yeah. hope. Are we going to go back to private finance initiative with the 600% um, cost of investment in schools and hospitals because that surely is a, a model that has Your failed. Your plan is what like I'm private finance well, on steroids. I'm it not is sure. worse than that. You I'm want to just put quantitative easing in. I'm you not, are not being straight with people. I'm and that's sure why there's huge numbers of economists um, have said it doesn't stack up. I'm not it's sure not if, fair on people and it will fall apart. And what will we be, the Labour Party, if we go to people with false promises? It's like Nick Clegg before the 2010 election. A whole load of false promises that then fall, fell apart. It's not fair and we will I'm, let people down if we do. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at the proposals, and they are proposals that have been put forward and have been supported by a very large number of economists, including Nobel Prize winning economists, who say this is a sensible and reasonable idea that we do a combination of during a period of recession to use quantitative easing, We're during not a in period recession. during a wait a minute, during a period of growth you use government bonds as a way of funding development within our society. The problems we've got, and I repeat it, is that we are funding public services by the sale of assets, by private finance initiative, and we are losing control of those assets, and it's costing a lot of people very dear in cuts that are being made in health and education in order to pay for the voracious appetite cuts, why don't of you these ditch private the finance money? companies that if have taken things the, over. If you ditch the printing money... If you ditch the printing money, we could set out a credible alternative. That means we don't have to do George Osborne's 40%. The problem is, if all you promise is something that won't stack up, you will let the Tories get away with this. You will let the Tories be able to get away with their 40% cuts to our public services. I think that would be devastating. It's an ideology of austerity that will rip apart our public services and it will hugely undermine our economy. But if we're really going to stand up to them, we've got to be strong enough and credible enough to do it, not just pretend that money will come out of thin air by printing it. Let's have a strong real I'm alternative. Pleased that you we should work together on Yvette. doing that, but you're not doing so because you're Yvette, offering people Yvette, false hope I'm instead. I'm very pleased that you accept that the politics of austerity is one of the problems we face. We went into the last election promising cuts. We went into the 2010 election promising cuts. Are we going to go into a 2020 election because Osborne will not have balanced the books by that stage, saying, well, an incoming Labour government, the first thing we've got to do is make more cuts in order to make ourselves credible. I say invest to grow. Yes, you can't no, cut yeah. your way to prosperity. Well, I'm afraid that on that note, our time is up. Uh, and uh, 
I would like, uh, first of all, to thank our audience here for their uh, very vigorous participation in the debate. I'd like to uh, thank our hosts here at uh, SAGE uh, in Gateshead. And above all, of course, I'd like to thank our four candidates tonight, Jeremy Corbyn, Liz Kendall, Yvette Cooper and Andy Burnham. <laughs>